Hi folks, I'm Keith Walker. So glad you joined me here today. So I want to talk to you um, about the ongoing adventures that's been going on. So here are a few practical steps towards racial diversity and reconciliation. And this comes from Dr. Harold Lewis. It's a four step process that we have here. One is gonna be listen, lament, learn, and lead. And this is to my white brothers and sisters. <laughs> Humble yourselves into what black culture is telling you, what the black community is telling you. Um, we have so long, for over 400 years, we've wanted to, you to listen to our pain, to realize what's going on. A lot of times in everything, you'll see the lashing out with the protesting going on everything is because we're tired of not being listened to. This stuff goes on every day in the black community and nothing is seemed to be done. It's like we're kind of just thrown away. So we want you to open up your hearts and listen to what we have to say. The next step would be lament. People, we want you to feel our pain, okay? Sometimes I don't think that you think that we actually have any pain because of where you are and your status and everything. So for you to be able to lament and understand what we're going through, it helps you to push forward to get equal rights for everyone, okay? If you couldn't hear that man hollering, I can't breathe, when you hear a grown man scream for his mama, okay? That pain should have resonated through you. Next thing is gonna be learn. You have to educate, study historical and social injustices and discrimination towards different people groups. If you have a neighbor moving, he's of different ethnicity or different cultural background, go out there and meet him. Understand where he's coming from. You never know what could happen to everything. You can strike up one of the best conversations you ever had in your life with that particular person. You become best friends with him. And that's the first step for everybody getting on the same playing field. And that's all we want, for people to understand each other. Last thing we'll talk about is lead. Now, we all have the power to do something about it. We all have the power to influence other people around us. So if you see injustice being done and everything is, you say, you know what, that's not right, we're not having that and you'll be surprised at how that'll start something. You see it over and over again where you'll have um, people out there who saw something being done and they do something about it. They get caught on film, they don't even know they're being filmed. And later on, you know, they're doing a talk show or something saying, well, why'd you do that and everything? And they'll say, because it was the right thing to do. This is the right thing to do to talk about this stuff. Stop sweeping it under the rug. Let's come forward and let's come together. It'll be a beautiful thing breaking news concerning the U.S. economy. Official figures show that what's one of the hidden things in the Whitewater friends and family, this has been one of the most difficult weeks uh, in memory, and this has been one of the most difficult four months I can remember. Um, uh, but this week has been so hard. Um, there's just been so many forces that at work, and we're seeing um, we're seeing just something uh, rise up to the surface that is just so ugly, and uh, and it needs to be confronted. It needs we need to talk about it. We need to have a conversation about it, and that really is racial. Uh, reconciliation and racial justice. And so um, I've got my friend Keith here. Um, we love Keith. He's been with us for over four years now. Yep. And uh, we're so appreciative uh, for your voice and, and speaking into our church in this time. Um, what we'd like to do is just um, really walk people through a simple process uh, that can help many of us who have white skin who might not know what to do or be afraid to speak and not know how to start conversations. We're going to walk through uh, some steps that will really, uh, I think, help uh, us be able to engage uh, in cross-cultural conversation in growth and in learning and really following the way of Jesus. And so uh, we're going to go through this together. And um, again, I want to thank you for being here to, to help me with this. So um, the first thing is listen. Now, Keith, um, as a, a black man, what does this mean for uh, people of, of white background to actually listen? For over 400 years and everything, we've been trying to tell you that this stuff has been going on. It's like a powder keg, and now it's got to a point where it's exploded. And so people are just getting sick and tired of it. 
we want you to listen, not do anything about it. We want you to listen with purpose. Listen and do something about the things that you're seeing. What's it, what's it meant to you when you've had uh, friends, uh, white friends, just listen? Uh, it means a whole lot. It means they actually are interested in it. I, I have to admit, George, and everything, you were one of the first ones to call when this whole thing went down. That meant a lot. Because most times and everything is like, they're not going to do anything about it. Then I come over here and I see brother Michael Robb over there and your brother Evan. Now I'm sitting here in a studio with three white guys, all right? For that to happen, there is change out there. We just can't stop giving up hope. Um, there's, there's some people that have like uh, just white awkwardness and so they're afraid to engage or to ask questions because they don't want to sound stupid. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be offensive and say the wrong word. Um, you know, in a racially charged time. Um, how would you encourage someone who's feeling that way to, to still listen and reach out? Uh, you shouldn't feel guilt or whatnot. If it's something that you don't understand, just ask us. We'll let you know. I've always said fear, what it stands for, is false evidence appearing real. And a lot of times fear leads to racism, okay? You just, you turn a blind eye to it. Just ask us. We're not going to bite you. <laughs> we're not going to throw harm on you. Because when you do that, that shows us that you're really interested in seeing what we're doing. But also, I, I say that, that when you ask that question, be willing to accept the answers and be willing to do something about it if it's affecting you. Mm, like actually care. Exactly. Man, when I first saw the, the image of, uh, or I first saw the video of what happened to Ahmad Aubrey, uh -huh. and you and I did an interview that like week. Yeah. And we talked about it. Yep. And then within a week's time, mm -hmm. before we'd even released our interview, um, George Floyd was murdered. Right. With a with a knee in his neck. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing that image, and uh, yeah, it was so sickening to me. Uh, where, what, what does what does it say to you um, living in a world where where that can happen? Like, what, is, what, is, what did that image, um, after all that we've been through, through COVID-19, and then Ahmaud Aubrey, and then uh, other instances, and then that knee to the neck, I mean, what is, what is, that felt like a match that was just lighting up kindling. Um, it did light up kindling. Like I say, it's throwing gasoline on the fire already. But unfortunately, George, it's becoming commonplace in the black folks community. It's like, we're kind of used to it. And it's a shame because you shouldn't get callous like that. But it's like it's happening all the time and everything and nothing's being done. And I think that's why you have these people lashing out with the protests and everything is because they are sick and tired of it. Uh, but to do it that way in the way the cop was just smirking when he was doing it, it was like he knew that he would probably get off. And that's where the problem should come in. That's what people should be really outraged about. But this has been going on for a while, yours. This is not the only incidences. It's just now we got cell phones. If, to view if, if those hadn't been recorded, right. if they were unreported and right. unrecorded, like we would have never, the never injustice known. would no. have remained. Exactly. And so, so, so many times, there's so many cases that you don't know about that's happened uh, and everything that we, we hadn't been able to see. And they've gotten off scot-free with these incidents and everything. It's just that with the cell phone. But now, even though you had that happen and everything, you had cell phone footage of that. You had the one of Ahmaud Aubrey. I mean, it took them almost two months to arrest them. Why is that? You got it right in your face. And they said, what's well, under investigation? Under investigation of what? This is murder. And if the positions were reversed, if right. it was a exactly. black person who had put his knee exactly. on his neck, would, would it have uh, taken that long to arrest? No. Mm -mm. And, if that, it, and that is part of the anger. Right. Exactly. He may not even made it. If it was a, if it was a black man that was doing it and everything, is, he may not have even made it to the, to the to jailhouse. Seriously. It would have been that much done to him. Well, that leads us to the second step, um, which is lament. And lament is about connecting with pain, mm -hmm. connecting and empathizing with other cultures and minority groups in pain and grief. Keith, would you, would you just talk about why that's important? Um, so many times, like I said before and everything is, it seems like some white people don't think that we can feel pain. It's like, you know, we're supposed to be bigger and stronger so we can tolerate anything. We feel pain just like everybody else does. But our pain is that we're losing a lot of our black brothers and sisters for no reason at all. Okay, these are unarmed people that were just minding their own business. What I've been seeing now and everything is that white people begin together with black people because they're just as upset as we are. When you see a man's life snuffed out in front of your very eyes 
which is nothing more than murder, you can't help but be outraged by it. If you've got any kind of soul whatsoever, no matter what color you are. My daughter's seven years old, and last Thursday, um, me and my wife, we sat her down, and we had the conversation explaining racism, explaining that someone would be prejudiced and have hatred towards someone with different color for no other reason. I mean, uh, it, it just it was so sober. I got she got really quiet, mm -hmm. and uh, she, she had a hard time getting to sleep because she had a stomach ache that night. But it's nothing compared to the generations of black uh, mothers and fathers who have had to tell their kids about the treatment that they will likely have in their world. I tell a lot of times, you know, some of my white friends and everything, I said, do you have to talk with your child? They say, what talk is that? And I say, exactly. <laughs> you don't know anything about that. <laughs> and what I'm saying is, it's a whole lot different if I get pulled over and if you get pulled over. I'm constantly having to have my hands on my steering wheel. I have to ask permission to show him my license or show him my registrations. You wouldn't even think about that. If I make any sudden move, I could lose my life. If I'm a law-abiding citizen and I have a right to carry a gun with a permit, whatever and everything is, I have to let him know that. Automatically, it's gonna put him on edge. If you get pulled over and I get pulled over, you're gonna make it home to tell the story. I may or may not make it home. And that's just gotta stop. This leads us to our next step okay. of learn. Educate and study historical and social injustices uh, and discrimination toward different people groups. It's so important to uh, to continue to, to educate ourselves. When we stop learning, we're not able to lead. Would you, would you just speak to that a little bit? Um, just just what, why, why is education and studying actual historic tr truths important? There was a young lady, and I can't think of her name, but she wrote for the New York Times, it was called The 1619 Project. And people, everybody should read it. All races should read it. And it'll tell you about how the slavery started when we came over here about the 401 years of oppression and all of that. So. Once you reach out and you learn about these different cultures, you learn about the particular person, about what they were going through and why are they protesting? Why are they saying that, you know, it's, the system's rigged against us and everything? Then you could get a better understanding as to how they feel the way they feel. What about people who would say racism, they're not a racist, um, there really isn't systemic problems anymore. Um, what would you say to someone? That's your white privilege talking, because it doesn't affect you. You ain't had to put up with it and everything here, so no, it's not in your world. And again, I'll say, people, especially white people who have white privilege, those are the ones that we need to start speaking about this type of stuff, because you have all the privilege in the world. See, difference between me and you, George, you a shower away from being a supervisor, okay? Me, I have to be twice as good to get half of what you got. Hmm. I've got to be around my surroundings. I've got to be a, around, uh, aware of what I'm saying to you. I've got to be aware of where I am as far as like, I have a customer, she's an elderly white lady. I go and visit her just to kind of see how she's doing. But I have to have another white person with me just in case something goes down, mm -hmm. okay? Now, now, who would have thought that? I'm going to pray with this woman and everything, but I have to have another white person with me and everything is just because I fear that if something happens to this lady, they're gonna blame me. And I have no witnesses to say, well, no, Keith didn't do that. So when somebody says it and everything, I just immediately, white privilege comes to my head and everything, and you gotta get out of that mindset. Hmm. Once you start accepting that you do have the upper hand and everything, and you can do something about it, that's when you will notice how things will change. Hmm. Again, like I say, close your eyes for a few minutes and just think if you didn't have that. Hmm. Think about if you were the press one. Yeah. Think about that. Wouldn't be too good, would it? So before we can recognize the beauty of diversity, we have to recognize the ugliness of disparity. Right. I've always found like when I learn before I speak or I learn before I lead, I'm able to lead better. Mm -hmm. But if I speak before I have any context mm -hmm. of someone else's pain, of someone else's history, of a, a, a group of people's history, um, like I don't know what I'm talking about. Right. And it's gonna, it's gonna be revealed very quickly. So this, we can't skip this. Equality isn't sameness. Um, equality between people doesn't mean that we're all the same. And uh, many of us can be from backgrounds, I'm talking you know, from my white background, uh, can feel that if I'm just, if I'm just uh, colorblind and I don't see any difference between anybody, then that makes it, then that everything's fine. But then I'm not acknowledging or knowing the difference in culture. I'm not actually uh, 
seeing the beauty and celebrating and appreciating the differences in cultures. Can you can you speak to that, Keith? We as black children, we our parents have to prepare us to go out into the world. We have to see that difference in order to kind of stay alive. It's good to see the differences and we can kind of appreciate each other's differences that we bring to the table. And that way we can have discussions like this. And that's the only way that's gonna change up the way that we think. What are things that you've noticed about like uh, white Northwest culture? Um, Y'all love hugging trees. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hugged one on my way in here. So, yeah. No, um, seriously though, I was telling a story earlier. Uh, it was so funny. When I first got out here, um, coming from Mississippi, uh, the first job I had, I was invited uh, over to this guy's house. He's a white guy. I was invited over to his house for dinner. In my mind, I'm like, like, what do you mean? Why do you want to invite me? Because usually you don't have a whole lot of that going on, intermingling white and black, especially where I'm from. And so I get out there and I was telling my spouse at the time and everything, I told her, I said, okay, if anything goes down, the gun's in the car, you follow me. If anything goes down, we run back to the car and then we get up out of here. I get there, knock on the door, just the kindest, nicest people you ever want to meet. And it's like it put all my fears to rest because he was willing to accept me for who I was. Even his dad came out there uh, to, to introduce himself to me and to make me feel warm and welcome. Um, so those were some of the things that I experienced that I couldn't believe. And then probably the strangest thing I saw was I was at a, a guy's house and we were having dinner. At the corner of my eye, I saw something. And I couldn't believe what I saw. I was like, he was explaining something to me. I was like, whoa, 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 let me ask you a question. Did your dog just go use the litter box? <laughs> <laughs> Down south, we don't have that. <laughs> and we couldn't understand. I couldn't understand where that was coming from. So those are some of the difference. Only in Northwest. Only in Northwest. White culture. <laughs> 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 you have to open up some. Hmm. And allow yourself to be vulnerable sometimes and everything is to meet that person. Even though we get in our own little world and we're pretty comfortable, everything is comfortable. Well, sometimes you have to be a little uncomfortable in order to grow. And when you grow, you have less of the stuff that's going on around this world today that makes things hard on people. Hmm. This fourth uh, step is, I think, really, really important because you can do all of these other three. Mm -hmm. But if we don't lead by using our influence, like our sphere of influence, every one of us has a sphere of influence. Even right now in the middle of COVID-19, we have spheres of influence. So how do we leverage and lead through our, our influence to love and serve other cultures and people groups? And I'll just, I'll, I'll say this, Keith, and I want you to speak to this. Um, in times past, uh, I, I would even say from my background, um, as, a, as a pastor, part of, uh, you know, church families that go back a couple hundred years, like there's like this desire not to cause tension. We don't want to cause tension. And so we're not going to enter in. We're not going to speak up about these issues because they cause tension. It feels like disunity. It feels like uh, if someone's going to be upset, someone, no matter what I do, so I'm just going to stay silent. And I think silence um, has spoken loudly and painfully into the black community. Um, and it's, it's something that I am learning even just about myself and my background, how uh, not speaking out and standing up clearly uh, against uh, communal, systemic, personal forms of partiality and racism, how badly that has hurt um, black brothers and sisters. Would you just speak to the power and the importance of when, when, uh, when others, uh, others speak up? When you are of, let's put it like this, when you have a lot of power in who you are, affluence or whatever, and you speak on these injustices being done, this is what helps us to heal. This is what helps black people to say, you know what, maybe they do care about us. Now, people are always saying everything is, well, you know, all lives matter, you're right. But what we talked about is black lives matter because of these people that's getting killed senselessly in the street, okay? All lives do matter, absolutely right. Even in the blue, it matters. But we have to bridge a gap between that. And when you got powerful head figures speaking and everything on these particular causes and stuff, this is what gets change done. P 
people don't want to get involved with this because they are scared of what the ramifications may be against their church or mm. their donation or whatever, instead of doing the right thing. My thing is, if you speak the truth and everything is, people gonna come to you. You're gonna get all that stuff back in space. It's just, we have to stop being so scared about speaking about stuff like this. I mean, why, for what? You only live one time. You don't want to be in your deathbed saying, you know what, I should have spoke up when I had the chance. I had the power and the chance to make a change and I didn't do it. All right? Cause, like my dad always used to tell my, me and my brother, that's between you and your God. <laughs> <laughs> to whom much is given, much is to be expected. And on, on this issue, um, Jesus followers have to speak up. We have to stand up. Um, Jesus was always speaking up and standing with um, the broken, the downtrodden, those who were being crushed by uh, the, the religious systems, the government systems, just the, the systems that, uh, of partiality and racism even in his own time. I mean, it is so clear that we have to be able to speak up for our brothers and, and sisters in truth and love and for the purpose of peace. Um, and and I, I, we don't want to just abandon the tools of peace um, because we're angry. Um, Jesus followers, we, we actually are embodying by our actions and by our words the way of peace. But, we're st but we still speak up. And in Jesus' case, that is exactly what got him put on a cross. When he crossed the religious leaders when he uh, was seen as undermining the systems that had been built for their religion and their power, and he was threatening their power, him crossing their powers would put him on a cross. But we we're followers of Jesus. And so we, I, I just want to encourage and implore brothers and sisters of all colors, but especially those in places of power, especially those who have maybe stayed silent. Um, we cannot be silent on this. We have to stand with our brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen.